Hello, and welcome to the American Society of, of Agron Agroni Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America Journal Webinar Series. I'm Ann Edal with the Soil Science Society of America Journal, and thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that questions can be answered in the question and answer section, and the moderator will address them at the end of the presentation. The webinar will be recorded and the recording will be emailed to all attendees after the session. Now I am happy to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Maysoon Mika, a technical editor for the Soil Science Society of America Journal. Dr. Mika is a research soil scientist with the USDA ARS Central Great Plains Research Management Research located in Akron, Colorado. She has been with the USDA Agricultural Research Service for 20 years. Her research focuses on crop production, remediation of eroded land, and soil health assessment under different management practices. Welcome, Dr. Mika. Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, hello, and welcome to the journal webinar series for, of American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America Journal. I am your moderator, Maysun Mike, a current technical editor for Soil Science Society of America Journal. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. We are excited to continue this monthly webinar series, which feature the latest research published in American Society of Agronomy, Crop so Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America Journals. Before we begin, I would like to mention again that questions can be entered in question and answer section, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. The webinar will be recorded, and the recording will be emailed to the attendees, all attendees, after the session. Without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Uh, Tom Sowers. Dr. Sowers, was a research soil scientist with the USDA Agriculture Research Service for 29 years before retiring in December of 2022. His research focused on agroforest practices and their effects on soil quality and, and local microclimate. His agriculture conservation experience uh, service position supported forest and agroforest soil health efforts uh, of, so of NRCS Soil Health Division. Today, Dr. Sauer will speak about Eastern Red Cedar. Red Cedar is known for its unique wood and persistent encroachment on grassland. Uh, he will discuss the soil quality and biofuel potential of this hardy widespread species native to North America. The report was published in July 2023 issue of Soil Science Society of America Journal. Dr. Sauer, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Maysoon. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. And uh, as introduced, I'm gonna be talking about red cedar. Red cedar is uh, one of those tree species that you can hardly find a neutral position on. Uh, it's sort of like the star player on your arch rival baseball team. You have to admire their abilities, but you doesn't mean you have to like them. And I think that's a lot of the feeling about red cedar. And I'm gonna go into some of the reasons why people may have strong feelings about uh, red cedar and other juniper species today. First of all, um, most people are familiar with red cedar in the context of things like cedar chess, where uh, this brightly colored, often uh, red heartwood is used to make these uh, chests that are naturally uh, insect resistant. But there are other uses of red cedar, many of them shown here, and this is taken from that report by Gold et al. from the University of Missouri 
Center for Agroforestry. So the unique properties of red cedar, are they contain the uh, natural organic chemical polyoxyphenols and others, which are still being used and discovered that have naturally antimicrobial properties. So the wood redu uh, um, resists decomposition and also has those antimicrobial, antifungal properties that are sought after. Cedar wood oil is also used in the fragrance industry. Um, so if you want a little summary of some of the uses of red cedar, Dr. Chung Ho Lin at the University of Missouri, Columbia has this YouTube video where he's looking at and discovering some of these new natural organic chemicals inside cedar wood. Um, including one of the uses is for uh, skin cancer treatment, anti-melanoma. The species is native to much of the eastern U.S., shown in the map on the right there. Uh, has several different names, including pencil cedar, red juniper, Virginia juniper, and savin. Actually, it's not a cedar. It is a juniper. So Juniperus virginiana is a scientific name. Donald Culross Patey, in his 1950 book, A Natural History of Trees of Eastern and Central North America, wrote, no stone-walled hilltop too bleak, no abandoned field too thin of soil, but that the dark and resolute figure of the red cedar may take its stand there, enduring with luck perhaps three centuries. So this is a testament to the cedar growing on almost any soil, except for soils that are very wet, and although a slow grower, being persistent and living for up to three centuries. Note that the natural range goes to about the center of the U.S. Great Plains. This is important because during the Dust Bowl, when uh, the Roosevelt administration was setting out the Shelter Belt project throughout the Great Plains, um, one of the aspects that they used in choosing which trees to plant were those that were native and those that were most likely to survive under those drought stress conditions. So if you're not familiar with the Prairie States Forestry Project, um, it was from 1935 to 1942 in response to the Dust Bowl of the U.S. Great Plains, and they identified a planting zone that was 100 miles wide from the Canadian border to Texas. So it included the Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. They planted 217 million trees in 18,600 miles of windbreaks. The map on the right is from that Reed report in 1958, where they went back to look at the survivability of the plantings and found 73% fair to excellent condition. So those Shaded areas in black are those areas that had concentrated plantings from the uh, Prairie States project. In 2000, 2008, 2009, there was a survey done of trees outside of forests, that's what TOF stands for, of the Dakotas, Nebraska, and Kansas, where they looked at rural areas and tree plantings in those areas. They found about 200 million trees in windbreaks in those four states. And in the bottom graph, you'll see that the second most common species was red cedar or juniper. Noted that the most common species was ash, and that was the reason for the survey. So due to the emerald ash borer, it's entirely possible that red cedar will be the most common species in uh, trees outside of forests in the Great Plains states. So we've, we already mentioned the encroachment problem. And here's the thing. Um, when Leopold wrote this almost a century ago in the Journal of Forestry, Aldo Leopold wrote, these ranges had never been grazed and they grazed them to death, thus removing the grass and automatically checking the possibility of widespread fires. The removal of the grass will leave the brush species of root competition and of fire damage and thereby cause them to spread and take the country. So what happened is uh, when the native grasses were overgrazed, grazed out, that fuel load was lost. And so even if there were fires, they weren't hot enough to keep the juniper in Leopold's case in the arid Southwest 
but it's the same process that was happening in the Great Plains with the Eastern Red Cedar. So over a period of a few decades, you go from a grassland to the cedar encroaching to such an extent that essentially it becomes a cedar forest. And of course, this is um, a serious problem for people involved in grazing management, and it's a constant struggle for, for them to try and control the red cedar. So here we have a situation where we have a species that has valued for some of its properties, and on the other hand, it's uh, the same durability and survivability that makes it an attractive species makes it also a problem when it's encroaching on grasslands. So you have some states that have banned the sale of red cedar for planting, whereas other states, they might recommend that it be one of the first choices for windbreak planting, for instance. So what we're trying to do in this study is to try and balance those two aspects of red cedar. This was the title of our project, uh, Woody Bioenergy Feedstock from Marginal Agricultural Lands, Red Cedar Feedstock Quality and Environmental Sustainability. We had six objectives in the project. I'm really only gonna talk about this fourth one where we're focusing on the soil organic matter content and uh, related soil quality indicators, but it was a comprehensive study looking at the feedstock quality, identifying those marginal lands, better estimates of the tree biomass, uh, a financial analysis, an economic analysis, and then an outreach and um, extension activities associated with red cedar. I will mention, just because it was even in the news just last week, that um, the funding was from the Sun Grant uh, project out of South Dakota, the North Central region. And so they're interested in bioenergy, in particular biofuels from woody biomass. So, <clears throat> excuse me, just last week in uh, the Minneapolis Star Tribune, there was this article about Delta and Excel push for sustainable aviation fuel in Minnesota, where they want to have 10% of the aviation fuel. Uh, by 2027 to be from renewable sources. Our collaborator, J.Y. Zhu, from the Forest Products Laboratory the, in Madison, Wisconsin, had already had experience in converting woody biomass to aviation fuel. And he has this project or this process called SPORL, the sulfite pretreatment to overcome recalcitrance of lignocellulose. So this is a pretreatment that is used to try and enhance the conversion rate of woody biomass for uh, fuel production. The figure on the top left shows results from, from our study where the, the uh, light green bars are those with the enhanced uh, uh, glucose production from the residue using that sporal process. And this is all I'm really gonna mention about, about this other than uh, to say that um, JY was a little bit uh, disappointed in the productivity of the um, process using red cedar. However, we only provided um, leaf and branch samples to him and we may have gotten a uh, higher productivity or higher return um, with if we had provided uh, wood, essentially whole tree samples. But anyway, that is one of the potentials of red cedar and you so you can see if you have a species that is encroaching and you want to find a way to get rid of it what better way than to try and turn your lemon into lemonade by producing biofuel with it in our study we um, looked at the states in the north central region and we set out these sampling transects which uh, we then identified three locations across each of those three transects to do our field work. These are our sampling sites uh, from north to south in the table. So we have a variation in mean annual precipitation, mean annual temperature, tree ages from 22 to 59 years. Um, most of the adjacent land was either in uh, for some sort of forage or grazing land. We had two sites with a row crop. All of the soils except for the Leon site in Iowa were uh, formed in grasslands, so they're mollusols. And then we had ranges in texture from sandy loam to clay loam. The Leon site at the bottom shows uneven tree age. 
That's because this is one of those sites where the red cedar are encroaching on a pasture. And also note that that was a forest soil originally uh, a, ha a haplodolph. So at each of these sites, we would go inside the tree planting and find nine measurement sites where we would uh, put these two rings into the ground for our measurements and sample collection. Outside of the trees, at a, high, at a distance of three times the tree height away into the field, we would then reproduce the exact same orientation of our samples and sample the adjacent field. So the distance between the samples inside the trees and in the field were dictated by how tall the trees were, often uh, related to how, how old the trees were. This twin, twin ring technique is used for measuring soil hydraulic properties, but we also use that to um, uh, take some, some additional samples and penetrometer readings. So these paired rings, we made measurements at the same time. We ponded water in there at a one centimeter depth measured water flow into the, into the soil until we had equilibrium conditions. Inside the large ring, then we took a soil core to 30 centimeter depth and sectioned that core into different, different depths to make our measurements in the laboratory. Then we, in the small ring, we measured uh, soil penetration resistance to look at the ability for roots to penetrate into the soil. One of the most interesting uh, parameters in most of these studies is the carbon sequestration potential or the soil organic carbon content in the soil. All of these graphs that I'll show are, are similar. The number of stars above the bars indicate a statistical significant difference. The little box on the right says um, tree greater than field, eight out of nine locations. The in parentheses shows that there were five of those differences were statistically significant. In this case, for soil organic carbon content to 30 centimeter depth, eight of the nine sites, there was more carb soil organic carbon beneath the trees. Only the Dickinson, North Dakota site had higher soil organic carbon in the adjacent field. Similarly, for total nitrogen in the lower graph, um, six of the nine sites with four significant differences with higher nitrogen under the trees, and uh, three of the sites higher in the field with one of those, in this case Dickinson, having higher nitrogen underneath the, in the field as compared to underneath the red cedar. So overall, we see a fairly clear picture on average, about 16.8% soil organic carbon underneath the red cedar, likely due to the lack of disturbance since the trees were planted and the uh, additional biomass growth with uh, deposition of uh, needles and leaves on the soil surface and de decomposition of fine roots. This is the sort of key graph of the presentation. We're going to focus on the, the top graph first, which is annual tree growth, the amount of increase in carbon in the above ground biomass over time. The X-axis is mean annual precip precipitation. So going from left to right, it's from dry to wet. And I have the names of the locations and the age of the trees shown in that top graph. So very clearly, strong relationship between how much rainfall or precipitation occurs at a site and the annual increase in uh, above brown biomass and carbon. The lowest was at that Dickinson site, the highest at the Dundee site with the highest amount of precipitation. On average, 2.05 megagrams of carbon per hectare per year. Just to put that in perspective, there is a survey of uh, Northern Great Plains conifer species and their average was about three. So again, the, the red cedar is a slower growing species. So that's not too surprising that maybe it's a little less accumulating a little less biomass and carbon than other species. Now the bottom figure is the soil. So the green points in line are for the tree sites and the blue are for the field sites. Again, note that there's this real strong relationship with mean annual precipitation. And on average, 
for the eight locations. Now, the estimate is that we're accumulating 0.3 megagrams of carbon per hectare per year. So quite a lot less than uh, the above ground biomass. And note that, again, the Dickinson site actually lost carbon after the trees were planted. And the Rosso site had the highest rate of uh, carbon accumulation. So we see a very strong relationship between tree growth and soil organic carbon. And this is to be expected when you have um, the inputs from the trees uh, providing the uh, material that can be decomposed and brought into the soil organic carbon pools. But note too that the crop locations had the very similar relationship. So it's not only the tree growth, but the growth of the grassland or the crop growth potential at the site that was affecting uh, the accumulation of carbon. At one location, we had some additional measurements. So we took advantage of that. This was at our Mead site, Mead, Nebraska, where the above ground biomass we estimated at 98 megagrams of carbon per hectare. From a study of the similar site, um, we estimated the litter layer at 13 megagrams estimated the root contribution at 35 and the total at 146 megagrams of carbon per hectare. So that's all of the above ground and plant related material. Our soil measurement was 72 to 30 centimeters. From other work that we know uh, that the depth to 30 centimeters, the carbon in that layer is about half of what's in the total profile. So our estimates for the mead site is there almost is exactly the same amount of carbon in the tree biomass as there is in the soil. Just trying to put these numbers into perspective. Some of our other measurements that we made real briefly, we measured infiltration. That's important because if you have a water limited growth situation, you want to capture as much of the precipitation that does occur. We had less strong relationships here, partly because infiltration is a notoriously variable property. So we had um, six of the nine sites had greater infiltration under the trees, but only three of those were statistically significant with the, uh, with the large ring and the bottom graph with the small ring. Uh, we had a, a few more st uh, statistical significant differences, but again, highly variable, large error bars, but generally a trend that we had greater infiltration underneath the red cedar trees. And the last parameter we're going to look at is penetration resistance. The figure on the top left shows the average for the nine measurements under the crop and under the tree cover at the mead site 2,000 kilopascals or 2 megapascal resistance is considered generally considered the resist the layer that's resistance to or the resistance that will impede root growth. Um, on the crop side, you can see that it reaches that just about 20 centimeters. That's likely a, a plow pan in the soil, but it actually decreases after you pass through the plow pan. Whereas for the um, red cedar the resistance continued to increase, suggesting that it would be difficult for the trees to root below 20 centimeters. This study um, is limited by the fact that you need to make these measurements under saturated soil conditions, and we always couldn't guarantee that we necessarily saturated the soil to that full 30 centimeter depth. Now summarizing for all sites, um, the depth to that uh, two megapascal penetration resistance is shown in the graph on the top. So for the nine sites, eight of the nine sites, the depth to that two megapascals was greater underneath the trees than in the crop, indicating uh, ability for the trees to root to a greater depth than in the crop field. The only uh, site that uh, did not have that relationship was the, the Dundee site in Minnesota, which was statistically significant. The bottom figure shows um, the field minus tree uh, measurements. So anywhere in the white area above zero shows that the 
value for the resistance was greater underneath the, in the field than underneath the trees. But notice with depth greater than, especially greater than 20 centimeters, we saw several locations where now we were running into greater resistance underneath the uh, cedar trees as compared to the crop field. This data is um, difficult to interpret sometime because if you hit a tree root, it suggests that rooting is not uh, uh, roots are not able to grow there, and yet, in fact, you've discovered a root there with your penetrometer. So, to summarize, um, the soil organic carbon stocks under the eastern red cedar were significantly higher at eight of the nine locations. Um, sorry, were at five of the locations where they were higher at eight of the nine locations by an average of 16.8 percent. The accumulation rate was at 0.3 megagrams of carbon per hectare per year, which is a low value compared to other measurements, similar measurements made in the Great Plains. The tree above ground carbon stocks were estimated to increase an average of 2.05 hectares per year. And these, both the soil and the tree biomass were strongly correlated with mean annual precipitation. We found fewer significant differences for infiltration and penetration resistance and smaller and less consistent differences for some other soil properties that I didn't mention today. And lastly, uh, the potential for eastern red cedar planting or for carbon sequestration or bioenergy feedstock production is not likely to degrade soil quality and may actually improve uh, soil physical and chemical properties uh, in locations across the Great Plains. And on the bottom that shows the article from CSA News and the research article referred to at the, at the beginning of the uh, presentation today. I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors, colleagues, students who helped with the field and lab work, and then uh, acknowledge the funding from the North Central Regional Sun Grant Center. And with that, that ends my presentation. Um, and I believe we have time for questions. Thank you, Dr. Sauer, for the great presentation. Questions? Well, I could perhaps answer, answer a question that I often have received in other presentations. That is, am I advocating the planting yeah. of red cedar? Well, yes and no. Um, if I had a grazed grassland, um, and I wanted to plant a windbreak, perhaps to uh, shelter cattle during the winter or provide shade uh, for cattle in the summer to escape the heat. Um, I would not plant red cedar just because of the encroachment risk and likelihood of encroachment onto that grassland. Um, however, if you um, had a farm site and or a crop field where the soil is cultivated, then the risk of that encroachment or the red cedar becoming a problem uh, is much less. And so then that's certainly a, um, a much more um, agreeable situation for considering planting that species. Okay. Uh, I think there is some kind of uh, miscommunication here and I am not uh, getting you through anybody else in our panel. I, I can see a couple of questions in the chat here. One is, okay. in, re in relation to climate-related weather extremes, do you envisage that this will limit the spread and infiltration of these cedars? Also, do you foresee a different succession species in the future? Um, I don't think that climate change will have as great an effect on a species like red cedar as it will on uh, some other species, just because they are so well adapted to a variety of conditions. So again, the only real limitation on red, spread or se red cedar spreading is really wet conditions. So uh, they're a survivor of drought as well. So they may actually, uh, like we're having a drought conditions this year, they may actually outcompete some of the other species under those circumstances. Um, yeah, so do I 
foresee a different succession species in the future, um, not in the areas like the Great Plains that, that uh, we are considering in this study. I think red cedar is the most likely species to continue in this pattern of encroachment and spreading. Another question is, what sort of plant diversity was found on the red cedar? That's a really good question because um, when there's a really uh, well-developed closed canopy of red cedar, there's no diversity underneath. It is one of the species that doesn't self-prune, so all of the old branches stay on the species. Um, there's very little light underneath, and so the the value for the ecosystem services is mainly cover for wildlife, uh, nesting for birds. Uh, it's a very dense cover, very good cover, but it allows very little light to reach the surface, and uh, so there's very little uh, plants, un very few plants under this in the understory. Do I have any insight as to the production of biochar from red cedar? That's another good question. And um, actually, I don't, in, in my research, I've never come across um, that I can recall a situation where people were making biochar from red cedar, but that certainly might be another possibility. I mean, there's a lot of different niche uses of red cedar. And um, so, you know, if we're looking for one single solution to, using up the biomass from these fields where it's encroaching or pastures where it's encroaching. I don't think that's likely, but maybe a lot of different uh, utilizations maybe um, should be considered and biochar could be one of those. That's a good, good yeah. question. I found another, I found a question here. Okay. Uh, how deep uh, did you find, uh, find root cedar tree roots? to go? How deep they go? Yeah, so we didn't measure uh, rooting depth directly. Uh, we only took soil cores to 30 centimeters. So that's really the only, uh, you know, the depth and we would see uh, cedar roots all the way to those 30 centimeters. They are a rather fine rooting, um, relatively shallow rooting species. Although having said that, they're also quite drought resistant. So we know that they, uh, must root to greater depths in order to survive those drought conditions. But we did not make any direct measurements of rooting depth of the cedars in our, in our study. Okay, we have another question. What is the effect of red cedar on soil water content and its effect on grassland productivity? Um, <clears throat> well, from you know, we did we we only visited our sites once, so we only had that snapshot in time. We have made uh, other measurements in different studies in red cedar windbreaks, comparing that to crop fields. So not necessarily directly for a grassland situation. How, however, my our, my our observations, my feeling is that the red cedars generally shed water, and so they are typically dry drier than the surrounding area directly underneath the trees, but they shed water at their margins. And so there are areas at the edge of the cedar trees that actually have more than the amount of precipitation. Um, so that's, that's an interesting feature of the species because many tree species sort of funnel water down their stems. From our measurements, the red cedars tend to shed water at their margins. So, um, they do intercept a, a fair amount of water themselves the, in their uh, leaves and branches. So, you know, I, I can't really directly assess that that uh, question about grasslands. They will use more water than than uh, grassland. Um, so there is that competition for water um, because there's a greater leaf area. The, the trees will use more water, it can have the potential to use more water, and that's water that's not available for, for growing grass if you're uh, into grazing grasslands. Okay, uh, we have a question, it's a little bit long, but okay. I will try to read it. I acknowledge the following species certain uh, inhabit some uh, constructing location. 
but has anyone looked at the physiological differences between northern white cedar and eastern red cedar? I know the generation of northern white cedar is very problematic in the upper peninsula of Michigan. The future looks very black when in comes to the species resistance. Yes, I think um, there are quite different situations there. Um, I believe the uh, northern white cedar is heavily browsed by deer. Um, red cedar, eastern red cedar, that's uh, not a preferred browse, browse species. Um, so from our own land here in Iowa, I've never lost a tree to, to deer. Uh, a red, sorry, a red cedar tree. I've lost nearly every other tree I've planted, a species of tree I've planted, but not a red cedar. Um, so I think there's quite different growth habits also between the red cedar and the white cedar that contribute to uh, the lack of natural regeneration uh, of the white cedar in those more forested environments. So uh, red cedar is typically more of a um, a successional species on the margins, although you know you can you can certainly find red cedar in the in the middle of forested areas. Um, whereas I don't think the white cedar fits that niche either. It's more of a um, more of a shade tolerant species that can be found inside forested areas. So there's quite a lot of difference between the two trees, even though they have um, you know they're both called cedar. There's quite a quite a difference in their growth habits and their their niches in the environment. Okay, we have a last question here. Does red cedar provide any benefit uh, or uh, uh, for in insect control or livestock? Oh, that's a good question and I don't have a good answer. Um, I know that the cedar oil is used for tick repellent, um, but I think that's not necessarily used for animals, although maybe I shouldn't have said that because I don't know. I've never used cedar oil uh, as a tick repellent, so perhaps it is used in livestock. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different uses and they're discovering different uses for cedar oil and the other cedar products. So um, it's, it's certainly a possible that it could be some sort of natural um, either insect control or insect repellent for livestock, but I'm afraid I'm not um, familiar with that um, application. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sauer. Uh, if anybody else uh, have uh, more questions, you can email to the Soil Science Society of American Journal. The uh, email is provided to all attendees and uh, the society will pass the question to Dr. Sauer. So thank you again for joining us for today's webinar and uh, to Dr. Sauer for sharing his research. As a, as a reminder, the recording will be made available and sent to all attendees soon. Thank you again and have a good day. Goodbye.